What's up guys, Jeff Boski here. Exactly three years ago today, I released my first YouTube poker vlog. It wasn't pretty. I shot it in world star hip hop mode. It was short, but the ending was a happy one. Three years later, I'm still pumping out videos, almost 400 in total. And I wanna thank you guys for joining in on the party and getting a glimpse into what it looks like to be a professional poker player. Not just a professional poker player, a professional tournament poker player, the most volatile of all the formats, debatably the most soul crushing, the biggest emotional roller coasters, the highest highs, the lowest lows. You almost have to be bipolar to be successful in this line of work. In this video, I'm going to go over all of the traits that you must have in order to survive as a professional tournament poker player. Playing poker tournaments for a living is extremely difficult. There are many factors that can make this an unprofitable or even an unsustainable venture. The first trait you must possess is you need to be a better player than your opponents over the long run. Of course, you could just win the $1,000 tournament at the World Series of Poker for $400,000 and never play again, lock up the profit, and enjoy the sweet taste of victory. That's highly improbable. You're going to have to play many, many tournaments to fully understand the nuances that comes with being a professional tournament poker player. Let's talk about the intangible skills needed to be a successful professional tournament poker player. Number one is bankroll management. The old saying, it takes money to make money. This is no different when it comes to No Limit Texas Hold'em tournaments. You put up your buy-in, and whatever happens, happens. You might lose 100% of it. You might win 5,000% of it back. There is a small chance that you could get staked or backed for a given tournament. But let's talk about using your own money. In general, I would recommend a bankroll of 200 buy-ins. 200 average buy-ins, to be precise. So you might play a $100 tournament. You might play a $500 tournament. But over 20 or 50 tournaments, if your average buy-in is $200, that is what we're going to calculate the amount of buy-ins that you need in order to sustain and ride the swings to embrace the variance, to lower your risk of ruin. For all you math experts out there, $200 times 200, that's $40,000 that you need in order to withstand the swings, and you still might go broke. You could just go on a huge downswing. You could just tilt off your roll in the pits or on sports bets one day. You can get drunk, go to the strip club, and lose a few grand. All these things add up. Many people aspire to be a professional poker player because they love playing the game. They don't like their current job, so they could just quit their job, have fun playing poker, winning money, and being their own boss. Sounds great, in theory. But not only do you have to be a witty player, you have to win at a rate that far exceeds the rake, taxes, and various expenses that come with the job. Food, clothing, travel, health insurance. All these things people don't really think about before they make the leap. Dive into the deep end that is professional tournament poker. Stability is one of the biggest concerns of being a professional tournament poker player. I've lost at least one girlfriend who said that my job was not stable enough for her liking and she couldn't see herself being with someone that could win 12K one month and lose 4K the next month. Even though that's a net profit of 4,000 per month, the, losing the 4,000 hurt her more than me winning the 12,000. She would have rather seen me have a nine to five job making $20 an hour. That's steady, dependable income is what people strive for. It's what they're brought up to get. Most people can't handle the volatility of gambling for a living. Let's talk about the mental game. Tilt control is very important. You have to be emotionally stable through the highs and lows, not only when you're sitting at the table, not only when you're playing four tables online, but during your off time also. Life comes at you quick. And if you don't stop and look around once in a while, it's going to pass you right by. Also, life's going to kick you in the balls a lot. 
And that can start a chain reaction of horrible decisions that is really going to ruin your life. Never act irrationally on the tables or away from the tables. I know easier said than done, but just think about this when life throws you a curveball. Whether your dog dies, your girlfriend breaks up with you, you get a flat tire, a guy sucks out on you for a 600,000 chip pot on the final table bubble, you can't just spew it off. You can't take a couple shots, dump a few grand in the pits, hit the strip club, make some sports bets, drive home drunk, get a DUI, lose your license, and then what? Avoid the chain reaction at all costs. Let's talk about tournament selection. This is very important, especially when you're in Las Vegas around the World Series of Poker time. There are five to 10 casinos within 10 miles of each other that all have great tournaments to choose from. There might be a $200 at the Golden Nugget, a $500 at the Win, a $1,000 at the World Series of Poker. Depending on your bankroll and skill level, you have to make the correct decision. In this scenario, a 200, a 500, and a 1,000, you have to realize all the other players are aware of these tournaments. If they're a top tier regular, they're gonna to gravitate towards the biggest buy-in. Their ego might be bigger than their bankroll. But in general, you want a tournament select. You wanna play against weak players. I know I get this all the time. I'm tired of playing against these donkeys. They just suck out on me. Well, yeah, that's gonna happen. That's because they're playing bad and they're putting their money in bad, and sometimes they will win. Most of the time, you will win in these situations, but you don't factor that in. You don't realize it in the moment. You just remember the bad beats. You don't remember the bad beats that you put on others, and you don't remember the hands that hold up or the queens versus ace-king that you win. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to win that. But when they hit their ace-king, you're like, oh, lucky hit. Ace-king's a drawing hand. You gotta have the right mindset. You gotta tournament select. You gotta know where the bread is buttered. Just like any occupation, when it comes to playing poker for a living, you gotta love it. And I mean really love it. I mean wake up every day eager to play, eager to learn, eager to, dis to discuss hands with your friends and fellow pros. It must consume you for you to rise to the top. Do you think LeBron James just grew up and just casually played basketball? No. He loved the game. He aspired to be the greatest. You have to put 100% into it. You have to obsess about it. Obsessing about something and loving it is the combination that you need in order to get to the top of whatever occupation you choose. Hard work pays off, but also work smarter, not harder. Sometimes it's better to pay somebody to help promote your brand or to do some work that you don't want to do and your time is worth more than you're going to pay this person. Whether it's a maid to clean your house, whether it's the poop magician to pick up your dog poop, a dollar a day keeps the poop away, that's the price I'm willing to pay. Let's talk about honesty. You have to be honest with yourself. One of the toughest things about dealing with a downswing is realizing if you're playing bad or you're running bad or a combination of the two. This is when it's good to have good friends, fellow pros that are also winning players that you can discuss hands with that are going to be honest with you. They're not going to sugarcoat it and say, oh, unlucky, bro. Chalk it up as a cooler. You want them to say, no, you can't do this. That's a bad check raise. Just check fold the river. You missed a great bluff spot. A lot of people don't like taking advice from others, but these are the people that you need around you to make you a better player, to change your mental state. If you're leaking, you need someone to let you know you're leaking. In order to truly be a professional tournament poker player, you have to be able to see your win rate over the long run. If you are a primarily live poker player, it's tough to see your true win rate when it comes to tournaments. There might be one or two tournaments that you can play on a given day. So you're looking at, you know, three to 700 a year if you don't take any days off. Good luck. Good luck getting that much volume in and it's still not a good enough sample size. It's much easier to realize your true win rate or hourly or ROI in a given tournament size if you play online on a site like America's Card Room. I've been playing there for a couple of years and you can see my graph right here. Pretty decent sample size, but not 
anywhere near as big as the volume that I was able to put in on Tinder. 14 years ago, I quit my full-time job as a manager of a communications company. Hiring, firing, training, running a sales force of over, over 20 people. While going to University of Michigan full-time, I quit my job and dropped out of college because I loved poker. I not only loved it, I saw that I was very profitable in it. It's a big leap to take, it's a big risk, but if you follow your heart and have a little bit of logic behind your reasoning, you can make a good decision too. I'm not advocating quitting your job or dropping out of college to play poker for a living. Don't get it twisted. I did this 14 years ago, right after the moneymaker boom, it was prime time. As you can see from my Tinder graph, relative to the stakes, I started off very slow. I was a bankroll nit. I didn't have much money to gamble with. So I stayed in the lower stakes, really learning more and more about the game before taking shots, before moving up in the buy-ins. $3 freeze outs, $3 rebuys, $10 freeze outs, $5 rebuys, occasionally a $20 or $30 tournament online. But of course, thanks to Tinder, I could play 20 to 50 tournaments a day, no problem. 180 man, sit and goes, anything you can think of, they had it. So I spent most of my days and nights and crazy sleep schedules just grinding on Tinder, learning more and more about the game, trying out different moves, seeing what works, studying, and slowly progressing as a player. As it turns out, my biggest hurdle was the money. Putting up $20 and losing it in one hand never felt good to me. And I think it affected my play. I'd be afraid to put in that third barrel of a bluff. I'd be afraid to put in the warm four bet pre-flop if a guy was re-stealing from me. I wouldn't want to chase the flush draw if I was getting great odds because I didn't want to lose my $20. On top of that, if I was lucky enough to knit it up and make it to the final table, this is when I looked at the payouts and then it hit me. This is when I got nervous. This is when I tightened up even more just folding, hoping for the next pay jump, not keeping my eye on the prize. You want to play to win. And I wasn't doing this adequately. I wasn't losing, but as you can see, over thousands of tournaments, my win rate was not great. The big breakthrough for me was when I learned to disregard the buy-in. Still practice good bankroll management, but not sweat the buy-in after I've already registered. Just play it as a video game. Treat the chips like play money. I'm playing a video game. The goal is to win everybody's chips. If that happens, I win a prize. Only then would I look at what I won. This helped me immensely. And as you can see, in 2008, I believe, everything clicked. I was one of the pioneers of the min-raise pre-flop. Combined with that and all the fundamentals I picked up, mass tabling in the previous years, I went on a heater. The first week of August 2009, I won the Tinder nightly $162 tournament for, I believe, $25,000. And the very next night, I won the Tinder nightly $320 tournament for around $50,000. Combined with a few wins in the $3 rebuy and $10 rebuy, I had my first $100,000 profit month. August 2009 is a month I'll never forget. It was a great month. I would like to relive it like Groundhog Day, but alas, here we are. That heater continued pretty much up until 2010, flatlined for a while, and then April 15th, 2011 was a day that will go down in infamy. A date which will live in infamy. It was our Black Friday. The government shut down full tilt UBN Tinder. The DOJ seized the domains they took our jobs. They took our job. They took our jobs. They took our job. And they gave us no information as to if these sites would ever come back. Now I had a decision to make. Should I pursue another career? Should I wait patiently and hope that these online sites come back and the U.S. government realizes that they can just tax the winnings and transactions? It's all about the money in the end anyway. Maybe they can get that money. I waited about a year before I finally said, I can still play online poker, just not in the United States. So my options are Europe, Mexico, Thailand, 
or Canada. I had a few friends living in Canada, Vancouver specifically, not too far of a flight from Las Vegas. So I signed up for six months rent at a furnished one bedroom apartment in downtown Vancouver for $2,500 a month. I left my house vacant in Las Vegas to travel to Vancouver with a couple suitcases because the US government said that if I click a mouse, I might lose a house. Yet, at the same time, horse racing, the lotto, scratch off tickets, sports betting, all these things were legal because they were heavily taxed and regulated. Not to mention alcohol and cigarettes, but we'll leave that for another video. I spent my six months in Vancouver and I did quite well. I had a great time meeting new people, downtown Vancouver, great city, headquarters of Lululemon, my number one favorite clothing brand. I discovered the delicacy that is poutine, signed up on match.com. So when I was grinding online, I was setting up a date with a local girl from Vancouver every night. So times are good. After six months, Canada said it's uh, time to leave. Went back home to Vegas for a few months and realized, hey, not much going on here. Let's go back to Vancouver. I rented another furnished apartment and grinded nine to five pretty much every day. Got a girlfriend, made some more friends, ate some good food. But in the end, I didn't make much profit after all the living expenses. Luckily for the U.S. government, I still pay my taxes to them. As a professional poker player, you file as a professional gambler. There is self-employment tax. There are some tax write-offs, deductions based upon your business, which is poker, you know, travel, hotels, equipment. If you're a YouTube vlogger, there are some write-offs, but in the end, I'm not a tax professional. It's all about your wins versus your losses. So if I cash for 100,000 in tournaments in a given year, and I lose 50,000, my net profit is 50,000 minus expenses. Different tax brackets, yada, yada, yada. Bunch of yada, yada over the best part. Consult your CPA. Don't ask me for tax advice. Up until present, I've been mainly playing live and surviving as a professional tournament poker player. YouTube has provided me with some additional income through promotions, ACR, Raise Your Edge, you know, affiliate deals. Make sure you check out all the links in my description for a greater understanding of all the offers and promo deals that I have available. These affiliate links really helps the channel and you can probably save some money if you're looking to buy a new Tesla, you wanna sign up for a training course, you wanna sign up on ACR. I have like 20 different affiliate links, check them out. I get a lot of questions on Instagram, Twitter, jeffboski.com. You can check out the contact form if you ever want to hit me up. When viewers ask me for advice on becoming a professional poker player, I always say the same thing. Don't.